Yo, everybody, welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics, brought to you by Sketch.com. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is one of the hosts of the long running comics podcast, 11 O'Clock Comics, and one of the busiest guys in the original art collecting game. It's Jason Wood. Thanks for coming on, Jason. It is my distinct pleasure, David. I, I, as you know, I'm a big fan of your show and your website, and I'm a proud patron, so it's a real thrill to be on. I feel like I've been meaning to have a crossover show with you for a while. I don't know why, but I'm I'm glad we're finally making it happen, especially for the subject we're talking about, because, you know, f- for listeners, we're going to be talking a lot about original art collecting today and what's going on in that world, because there's a lot going on in that world. But I, I want to start with some basics for people who don't know you. I, you know, I never try, I always try to like not make guests talk about the basics of their life. Like I don't make creators read solicits or anything. I always read the solicits out for them, but I did want to start with a little bit about you for listeners that don't know. Like I said, you're, you're a podcast co-host for 11 o'clock comics. You're an avid original arts collector, but you know, what's your day job? Because I feel like that's super relevant to this conversation going forward. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, well, I am uh, I am the co-chief investment officer of a New York-based uh, asset management firm, and the there's a lot of things that go into that. But but I guess for for most of your listeners, the easiest way to describe it is I'm a portfolio manager. I run uh, a pool of assets for our uh, for our, our clients that um, are focused on U.S. equities and uh, and some private equity stuff. But but I'm a, I'm a portfolio manager is the easiest way to say it. So the ultimate point is, is you understand markets and you kind of understand, you, you know, it, part of your job is, I'm sure, to pay attention to markets, pay attention to what's affecting those things, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. I I, I, I went to, uh, to you know, I have a, my degrees in finance and, and I've, I've been in the capital markets for my entire professional life. Yeah, my, my, my job is very much, I, at the end of the day, the, 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 the commonality between my professional work, how I make a living, my passion for comics and art collecting, which we'll get into, and my other major hobby, which is which is uh, fantasy football analysis, is just being an analyst. It's about uh, having a love for data and patterns and trying to be able to synthesize everything I can into uh, forecastable outcomes. Oh, my God. I have to tell you something before we get into the original art stuff. This, you're going to hate me for this. So we, uh, for listeners, Jason and I play in a fantasy baseball league together. But this year... After, let's see, when did I first start? 1997, I quit fantasy football. Well, that that you're not alone, honestly, um, be, be, because of a variety of reasons. But but the pandemic being uh, a major one, a lot of people were uh, just not inspired to, to be into it because of all that's been going on. And, and also there was a lot of uncertainty about whether the season would happen, what it would look like, what would people do if they were halfway through the season and it was canceled. So uh, as an industry, the fantasy football industry took a big hit this year. Uh, numbers across, I'm um, friends and, and, and know a lot of the companies in, in the space. And, and numbers were down 20, 30, 40 percent pretty much everywhere across the whole spectrum. So, wow. Yeah. So it was a pretty big down year. Um, and, and I'm sure like with many other industries that were hit by this, we all hope it's transient. We hope that uh, we're past this pandemic and we get some trust, trusted, safe, proven vaccines and, and all of that good stuff. And and we can start putting this behind us in 2021 or 22 or whatever it is. But yeah, I mean, this is a tough year for, for, for sports, for, for the business of sports and, and, and fantasy football in particular. I will say this, though. Mine was actually not because of that. Mine was just because I love baseball because if you're a data nerd, like the, the variance isn't quite so great. Like there's a certain level of predictability to it. Football. I remember looking at the stats last year and like fourth, I think it was like the fourth week of the season. And like Ryan Fitzpatrick was leading in passing yards. Mm -hmm. Uh, A leading receiver was God, who was it? It was somebody crazy random. And then like the leading rusher was like the backup for some, for some team. And I just remember looking at it. I was like, how this is, this is a nightmare. Like, I just, I don't know, like the, for my logic brain, the variance in fantasy football, and also the fact I've actually kind of soured on football itself. For some reason, the, the TV timeouts have increasingly uh, graded at me. I'm a huge mm. basketball fan, mm-hmm. and that's my favorite sport to watch, and like, and actually soccer, but the the football i don't know i just kind of turned on it anyways uh, i've been accused of occasionally trying to turn my comics podcast into a sports podcast so i won't make that happen but let, let's get into original art collecting sure i wanted to get into the, the the beginning for you because i do think i you know as as somebody i mean i live in alaska i don't go to a lot of conventions but one of the weird things about original art collecting to a certain degree is i feel like 
for some people, there's a certain level of intimidation to it because, you know, look at like what's going on right now. Chris Somney's doing Batober. He's like putting those up, up on eBay and everything. And they're amazing. But one of the things is, is like, I think some people believe that there is a barrier to entry to get into it. So I'm interested in what your start was. Like, when did you start collecting original art and what was it that attracted you to, you know, getting into that world? Sure. I, first of all, I would agree with your premise, which is that uh, it can be or feel very daunting to people that are trying to get into it or want to maybe just dip their toes into the water. There's no question about that. So I do think that is a, a valid starting point to the conversation. Um, I started collecting original art uh, very much by chance. Um, I was, like you, not a frequent Comic-Con attendee for lots of reasons. I for me, collecting comics, uh, and, and just for frame of reference to your listeners, I'm, I'm 45 years old. So uh, I started collecting comics in earnest uh, in the 80s, early 80s. And, uh, but I was, it was always an insular thing for me growing up. Um, I had a lot of great buddies and, and whatnot, but they, none of them were into comics. So for me, it was pretty much just a thing I did on my own and, and was totally cool with it. It wasn't like I wasn't embarrassed by it, but it just wasn't something I didn't have a, there wasn't a social aspect to it. So I wasn't a con goer until. Honestly, the comics podcast scene started taking off and there was a show, which I'm sure you're familiar, really maybe almost like the uh, patient zero of comics podcasting and comic geek speak and comic geek speak had uh, a pretty vibrant comic forum back in the day. And for listeners that that don't know the timeline, we're talking probably 14, 15 years ago. Um, And they were one of the first comics podcasts and I was listening to it uh, when podcasts were first taking off. And quickly became ingrained in their community, uh, online community, you know, forums, message boards and the like, just meeting other people that loved comics as much as I did. And they had a few local get togethers. They're based in Reading, Pennsylvania, and they had a few uh, gatherings, small mini you think of them as mini cons with a couple hundred people for their 100th episode, their 200th episode. And so I remember at their 200th episode, they had uh, it was a mini con. They had artists set up uh, people like Mike Norton. I remember there Jamal Eigel. Um, uh, Daniel Corsetto, just a, a, a handful of, of creators that loved their show and a part of the community. And they were set up at tables and they were doing sketches. And uh, it was a, a, a small show and I was walking around talking to everybody. And next thing I knew, I just said, oh, I would love for you to draw me this. And I just named a random character. And, uh, and, and that was kind of the first realization about getting commissions. Uh, and the rest is really history. From there, as with all addicts, I am an addict when it comes to my fandom. <laughs> Um, I just became ravenous about it and researching it and reading and going online and finding out how do you get art, who sells it, what's it like? And it's been a process. I mean, um, well, I, I always shudder at the word expert in as much as there is expertise in this. It's been built over 15 years now and a lot of trial and error and a lot of learning and questions and mistakes. And uh, um, so. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's the journey. I will say uh, just before we move on, um, while I do agree that it can feel daunting the nice thing is, is it doesn't take a lot to get past that because believe it or not, especially in today where we're, where we are in 2020, the, the, the collecting market is, is more vibrant than ever. It's also more accessible. Like with, like any fandom that there, that you, there are not many areas of fandom where you can have direct one-to-one communication with the creators who make the art that you love. Right. And that's the way the comic industry is for good or for bad. Right. It depends on the circumstance. But but it is much easier to uh, to dip your toes in this hobby than almost anything else that you might seek to collect. Yeah. And I do think that on top of that, like the art reps, I mean, I know art reps have always been a part of this, art dealers, et cetera, et cetera. But Mm -hmm. I do feel like, you know, you look at somebody like Felix Liu, Felix Comic Art, like the last couple of week or so, there was a Stuart, Stuart Imminent art drop, you know, which yes. for, for a fanboy like me, I mean, it's like, oh, my God. And then Ryan Sook. And then, God, well, who who was it today? God, I forgot. Anyways, th- there was there was just, oh, I think it was uh, Ryan Otley. And so it was Ryan Otley. Yes. That's yeah, right. mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So th- there's there's just been, uh, you know, people like Felix or like uh, Jason. God, I'm going to totally mispronounce his name. Shaker. Shaker. At, uh, at Essential Sequential, et cetera, et cetera. You have all these different groups that you can go online and you can, it's like, you know, I like Stuart Eminem. I know this. I want to go on there and like, sure, I'll buy a, p- a page of Plunge. And it's not it's not hard. And honestly, I was kind of amazed by Stuart's prices. I really thought they were going to be higher. But anyways, but I mean, that is, that's amazing. Uh, the only problem for me, uh, Jason, is the fact that 
I'm in Alaska, and so that was going up at 8 a.m., and I am on a current month-long staycation, and apparently 8 a.m. is not conducive to my habits, and so I slept right through it, and by the time I got up, there was like 10 pieces left. Right. Well, um, full disclosure, I am great personal friends with Felix, uh, as as I am other reps like Paolo at Cadence uh, and Jason. So, so, and apologies for my dog barking. This is a part of working at home. You can't uh, avoid that. I apologize for that. Um, but, but yeah, so, so the one thing I'll say about, uh, uh Felix, I, I think he is, um, without peer at this point in terms of, of, of running his, his practice. And as you alluded that the, the, the great thing about him, but it can be maddening as a fan is that he is completely democratized when he has a listing of art. He takes, there is no favorites. There's no longtime collectors or buddies that can slide into his DMS the day before and say, Hey, can you hold that page off for me? He just doesn't do it. It's a, it's not in his his nature. And that can be very frustrating as someone who is his friend and would love for him to do that. Um, I do think it is very notable. And to your point, uh, yeah, he, listen, as you, as we've already established, I have a day job that's very time intensive during the trading hours. And so, uh, there are quite a few times when he will have an art listing that I'm just unable to participate in, not because I, I don't want to, but because I just can't break away at 12 on the dot, uh, my time. And, uh, and, and unfortunately if, He's built up such a a cadre of 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 collectors that if you aren't online at twelve sharp, uh, the chances of you getting the page or the commission or the piece that you want are very very slim. Yeah, I will say you know despite the fact that you're unavailable during certain hours, you're doing pretty well for yourself. <laughs> As I mentioned before we started recording, I actually went through every single page on your comic art fans page. That is fascinating to me. Un- under your tab for commissions and sketches, the number. 555 is in parentheses, which, you know, to me, who is currently surrounded by the bulk of my art collection, which is like nine pieces, is an unbelievable number. I mean, that's that's impressive, Jason. Uh, well, impressive or obsessive? Sure. <laughs> um, listen, uh, yes, it, it is. I, I, I was not joking when I call it an addiction, um, as my wife would attest if she were sitting in on the show. Uh, and, and look, let's also, let's, 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 let's be fair here. I I am incredibly grateful that I have a career and a financial circumstance that allows me to collect, uh, with that kind of, uh, volume. Right. Um, that said, uh, recognizing that, that I'm surely an outlier in that regard, I, I do think, um, the good news is whether you have one piece or a thousand pieces, it's still an amazingly fulfilling hobby. Um, yeah. And, and, and I have good friends that I, I go to at cons with multiple times a year and, and they have a budget of say getting one or two pieces each con. And in many ways there's a uh, more charm and purity to that because every one of their pieces was, uh, tightly curated and sought after and, 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 and coveted. And, um, ultimately, I mean, my litmus test is it's not how many pieces you have. It's that, when you sit down and look through your art, whether it's on the walls or in my case, I have a bunch of, of, of Atoya portfolios, are you, are, do, do you have joy? It's like Marie Kondo, right? Like, like do, when I look at the art, does it give me joy? And the nice thing I'll say is that I think you, it's, it would be a fair question to ask from people that, that have seen my calf gallery. You know, you must you own way too much art that you love it all. And the truth is, do I love it all? Probably not at this point. But I will tell you that 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 the vast majority of what I have, I do very much love. And that, and that should, I think, be the that should be the benchmark for any collector, uh, regardless of, of the size of your collection. If you ever feel like KonMari methoding some of your art, please feel free to send it to me. Fair enough. I'll keep you in mind. <laughs> well, I, you know, one thing that I do really love about collecting all this art is it, it ties into what you're saying. It's like even if you even if you just have a small collection, it's like. Every piece has a story behind it. And yes. I think that's really cool. Like, I'm going to tell you a quick story about my favorite piece. Are you cool mm-hmm. with that? Yeah, of course. Sure. Okay. So uh, in 2014, I believe it was, Guardians of the Galaxy was coming out. I used to be at Multiversity Comics. I was one of the main people that ran that. And we put together a, a an art auction tiding into Guardians of the Galaxy, but part- particularly Rocket Raccoon, to benefit the Mantlo family. And we... we you know, called in all of our markers, asked every artist we could to to participate. We had this amazing list, and then we auctioned all the pieces off. And there's one piece on there that I really, really wanted. It was a, a painted piece by Christian Ward. 
and it was fantastic. Uh, the auction was hotly, hotly contested, and it was between Michael Perlman, who you might know, and um, some unknown bidder. And it was it was just going, 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 going. And it was a number that chased me away far before then. I mean, it's not a huge number, but at the same time, I have like a unfortunate governor on my brain that restricts me from spending a whole lot of money. <laughs> and and so, anyways, the, the other person wins. I get a message from Michael. He was basically like, if the person backs out, I want it. Let me know. And I'm like, okay, cool. Definitely will let you know. Uh, whoever it was pays. And then it was that was August, you know, Months later, I I never I wasn't even thinking about it. And uh, Christmas comes, my parents had bought it for me. That is amazing. Yep, and they won oh the auction. Gosh. And later on, I told Michael Perlman, I'm like, unfortunately, I will. The winner did pay for it and will not give it up because it's me. You have amazing parents because I will tell you. I mean, I love my 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 dad, and 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 I'll throw my wife into this too. But they would not know where the first place to begin they wouldn't know what i wanted nor how to acquire it so it's it's, that's an incredible testament to your parents understanding you and what what drives you yeah i still have that piece framed it's in my office at work which means that i've been separated from it for months and months and months but Mm. at the same time it's just like i don't know i love that i love the fact that every piece has a story but that you know that does tie into something uh tie into something that i want to ask about i do think one of the intimidation factors weirdly Mm -hmm. for you know, for people who are new to this is, you know, where do you even start? It's like, what artist do I approach? What idea do I want that artist to execute? Like marrying those ideas is not obvious. But for you, I just want to, I'm just going to break down some of your pieces. You have an amazing collection of Moby Dick pieces, including your Daniel Warren Johnson piece, which is just unbelievable. (laughs) Then you also have this amazing mix of like, particularly Domino and Phantom X, but also a little bit of Beast work in there. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, how do you decide how you're going to, like, expand your your collection or, like, where you want to go? Do you just have these core group of ideas and then you identify artists for it? Or is it more fluid than that? Right. Yeah. It's it, it, and, and certainly this is a your mileage may vary. Um, I have good friends, collector buddies, um, almost like a Koretsu where we turn each other on to different collectors or, or dealers that we may come across. And their approach is much different than mine. Like, uh, the guys that I go to conventions with. Some of them go out of their way to do completely different subjects for every artist that they commission. Uh, I'm much more, as you noted, systematic than that. Um, But it didn't start that way. Uh, As I said, I mean, I almost happened in this by accident. And then for the first few years I collected, which was, I would say, was probably a more traditional pace, shall we say, where I get a few pieces at each con. Um, I would just ask an artist randomly whatever I was vibing on at the time. So you mentioned Guardians of the Galaxy. There was a period of time when I was super into that scene and I bought a bunch of pages of guardians published pages, I bought a bunch of rocket and group uh, commissions uh, early on in my collecting. I, I was and am, I guess a, a Deadpool and Wolverine fan. And I would ask for, for those characters. And then um, just as I started getting a little more used to the scene and feeling a little more comfortable with the reps and how the process of getting commissions worked and, and the, 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 the ups and downs of it and where, where things can go awry. Uh, I just came to this realization that, and again, many artists that may listen to this may disagree, but I came to this personal conclusion that a lot of artists were tired of drawing certain characters. Right. And, uh, and, and that's not to say that again, they may disagree with me, but I was like, I don't want to be the guy that asks them to draw their thousandth Batman or their thousandth Deadpool anymore. Right. So what can I do? That's going to make them draw. I want to figure out a character that they'll draw that they don't often draw. And I'm a kid a comics kid of the late eighties, early nineties, unapologetically. And it just, I think it was the third New York comic con. Um, I just said, you know what? Domino's a cool looking character. I, uh, she's a female character. And at that point I hadn't been getting many female characters, uh, many female sketches. And I thought I'm going to ask people to draw me Domino. And it worked out really well because people are like Domino, that's a deep cut. And it's probably less of a deep cut now that we've had the films and, uh, and what have you. But back then it was very much a, she hadn't really been seen in comics much at all at that point for a while. And so people were like, Oh, that's a deep cut. And it just kind of went from there. So to be clear, I mean, Domino is my muse. Generally speaking, um, I, I, these days it's a very different process for me these days because of the size of my collection for how long I've been doing it. I actively seek out new artists to draw 
Domino and Phantom X. Mm -hmm. So anytime I am introduced to a new artist, either online or through Instagram or convention, or if I, I see their work in a comic and I think, oh, I really like that style. Let me see if they're around or I can reach out to them. I am generally reaching out to them with the idea of, would you be interested in drawing Domino or Phantom X? Mm -hmm. Um, now, after that, uh, if I come to really love their work or we become personal friends or I just I, I have a, a, an added appreciation for them as an artist, I will often recommission uh, artists, uh, as you probably saw if you went through my collection. I have I have some artists I have many, many pieces from, like I think Matteo Scalera, I think I own almost 20 pieces from. Mm -hmm. um, I will then sort of branch out to other characters that I like. And then on occasion, I'll come across an artist like, say, like a Matt Lisniewski, who I very much like. But he has a very much an indie style, a very exaggerated anatomy. And I, I think, well, probably not the best person to draw a domino for me. So I'll, I'll do something that has maybe a different body type, like a beast or a taskmaster, where they can have a little more fun with it. And I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, I'll be totally pleased with whatever they decide to do from an anatomy perspective. Um, so that's how it's gone. And then you mentioned Moby Dick. Now, Moby Dick is a little different. Moby Dick was actually I was having dinner with Felix Lou, believe it or not. And we were talking about how cool it is to challenge artists with something that they just never get asked to do and i uh moby dick is one of my five favorite novels of all time i have a, a, a moby dick-esque whale tattoo on my on my arm uh and i thought wow like what if we got i said this to like, what if i got all of your crew over time to do their version of moby dick and that's where it started i got uh, as you mentioned i got daniel warren johnson to do a piece which uh, i think is my most viewed calf piece it uh, is at least it's up there yeah and I got uh, Riley Rossmo at the same con to do an amazing piece that's also on my front page. And that's just the kind of thing where I said, OK, you know what? For artists that I just absolutely adore and have multiple pieces from, I'm going to get them to commission primarily paint a Moby Dick piece for me. And unlike a lot of pieces where I'm doing it with a with a, a deadline or, or at a con, I'm going to commission them and say, here's the deal. Here's the budget. And, and when it's ready, I'm cool. And so that's kind of. That's almost like the alpha of my collection in the sense that, that that that's a tightly, carefully curated series of pieces that are only by people who I'm already intimately familiar with their work. Yeah. I mean, I like things like that, too, because I like that that reflects a personal interest that's very you. Like, that's a cool thing. Like, I always like theme sketchbooks. Like, Rico Renzi has a Mr. T sketchbook. Yeah, which I think, sure. Which, which is awesome. I have – I started one a few years ago that is superheroes doing ordinary things – and it's a lot of fun. I just I, I think having those things that are not just you doing something that's like, oh, draw me Batman. It's like something that's very singularly you. And that's really cool. But I did want to bring up the new artist thing. Um, artist Declan Shelby had a question for you. And it was, you know, you've always been he, he noted that you've always been kind to new artists over the years. And he was wondering if there are any you're happier to have seen taken off with big career sense. Because, you know, being part of the scene, I imagine you're on like the, uh, you know, you're first to the scene quite often. Well, first of all, that's very nice of Declan. And it's funny. Uh, it's almost like a loaded question from him because fun <laughs> fact, no fun fact, I am for sure. And I think he'll confirm this. The first person to ever buy original art from him. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, he had never been to the States and he had just started doing, uh, I think it was 28 days later. Mm -hmm. And then he had just, he had just begun doing Marvel work and uh, just randomly emailed him and said, Hey, I see you're going to be at this con I'm going to be at. Do you sell your artwork? And he wrote back saying, I'm certainly open to selling my artwork, but I've never sold it yet. And we just agreed that I, I met him up at that con and I bought a, a page from one of his Marvel issues. Um, uh, and, and that was history. And, and, and he literally, as I was buying it said, you know, you're the first person to ever buy art for me. And I thought, well, I won't be the last. And certainly <laughs> that was true. Um, you know, if if outside of the personal enjoyment of 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 it, the, the reason I think I'm addicted to being an art collector, particularly commissions, is exactly that. It's 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 ultimately comes down to my love for for comics and 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 the art side of comics in particular as a as a storytelling mechanism. And I have had like there's nothing about my collection that pleases me more than how many artists I own pieces from before they were you know, insert top billing here or, or, or at the top of, of the industry or at Marvel or DC. And in fact, um, I, guys like Felix and Jason and, and, and Paolo often joke with me that I should be like an A&R guy for them because most of the people in their, uh, stables, I own art from before they signed with them. And by the way, it's always to you newbie collectors out there in, in as much as you can get a piece from a, an artist directly before they're repped by one of these guys, do so because I assure you it's going to be much less expensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
like for example, I mean, I have a Daniel Warren Johnson. Oh, I have several, but but the first piece I got from from Dan, I think I, I and he'll, I, I hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying this. I think I, I think it was like ninety dollars. Wow, right? And and I can assure you again, I don't want to speak out of school, but but Daniel's rates justifiably are, are significantly higher than that now. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of who, well, Declan would certainly be at the top of that because that was the, the the OG, you know, patient zero for him. Um, but but Daniel certainly is 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 another. Um, there, God, there are there are lots. I mean, it like I said, it's somewhat of a of, of one of the things that excites me the most. Um, uh, I, I mean, I would say that uh, that people like uh, uh, Pepe Larraz um, comes to mind. He did a really so, nice domino piece for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh, another one that I think because he's got the big uh, Ryan Stegman. I certainly was an early collector of his work. Oh. Um, God, he'd kill me if I didn't mention him. Uh, uh, Scotty Young is a, is a great personal friend, um, mm-hmm. like family friend, like our families are friends. And and um, I was one of the first people to buy uh, his uh, Wizard of Oz pages. And for those that maybe don't know Scotty's career that well, I mean, Wizard of Oz was really the book that kind of elevated him to to to, to superstar status. So, uh, But there are a lot. I mean, honestly, that is something when I look at my calf gallery, I, I uh, quite a few artists now that are named artists, I think, wow, it's great that I – I'm so excited that I just that I not discovered them, but that I, I discovered their work and was able to get a piece of it before uh, it became prohibitively expensive. I do think, you know, it's really cool that you have all those relationships you've kind of fostered over the years. And, you know, just to tie into something else Declan said, he had just had a comment. He just wanted to say thanks for all the positivity you've added to the scene, be it through, you know, shows, podcasts, respecting artists, etc. And I know for a lot of people in comics, it's like, you know, you you get a lot from the good and the bad. And so people don't real. I mean, maybe people don't think about this, but somebody being a tremendously positive influence has a, a major impact. Is that something that you kind of pride yourself on as well? Like, you know, trying to not just be like a, you know, a, a shark who's going to try to eat up all the Danny Warren Johnson pieces or something like that, but like somebody sure. who's actually like a, a positive force in like the original art scene, but also in the comic scene in general. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that that's really a, a huge part of it, and and I think particularly a uh, point of emphasis would be this year. Uh, and and I'm not alone, but but I will say that um, I think off air you were joking or you were telling me about how you looked at our, my whole calf gallery, and I I I'd said to you I have I think forty plus pieces that I've yet to to scan and put into the gallery, and that's because this year in particular because of what happened with uh, with with the pandemic. Um, I mean, as you know, David, the vast majority of of, of creators are not doing this, getting rich from doing this right They're there. And, and they're, and the vast majority are freelancers. They're not under contract. They, they are responsible for their own healthcare and withholding taxes and all that stuff. And, and so certainly freelance, the freelance world was hit the hardest from this pandemic for sure. Uh, and, and again, as we both know, the industry effectively shut down for a few months. Um, and so I said to my wife at the start, because we were, we were brainstorming ways that we could help and not dissimilar to many other world citizens, whether it be ordering out from your favorite restaurants more often, whatever you thought you could do to help a little bit in its own way. And I said to her, here's what I'm thinking. I, I, I already don't need an excuse to collect art. That's, that's a given, but, but what would you be comfortable with me actively looking to commission as many artists as I could this year, uh, to, to, to help and just, you know, in, in, in a little way, do whatever way possible. And that's really what I saw that to do. And, and I wasn't alone. I mean, it, it was, I think, I think, uh, commission, and original art sales are through the roof this year, uh, both in terms of, of raw monetary value, but also volume. And I do think it's just a testament to how much we, let's call, uh, call it, when you, it sounds pretentious, but like the patrons of, of the industry, uh, value the creators. And, and it, it's been great to see. So yeah, I mean, I, I've gone crazy this year. I think I've honestly purchased over 160 pieces this year. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's But it was with the concerted effort of like, if not now, like this would be the year to go crazy because... Um, again, it, it, anyone listening, presuming you have the, this is all what you have to be within your means, but if you have the means and a budget, uh, you know, this was a time to support it. So yeah, I, I, I take great pride in that. And then also with our podcast, I mean, we, we, we are certainly not, uh, averse to saying we dislike a comic or a particular work that we read, but we have really gone out of our way, um, uh, particularly given our longevity to, just put out the good vibes of comics because when you read as many comics as we do and discuss as many comics as we do, the simple fact is you should be able to have something good to say each week, right? And and that's kind of the approach is that um, yes, there's a lot of negativity out there. There's a there's there's especially on on social media, 
But we also can't forget that social media is where a lot of us met. It's where a lot of us came to appreciate each other's work. Um, it's still where I discover uh, the work of, of many phenomenal artists and writers. And and so I think it's just about, you know, you you kind of have to put you have to. It's one thing to to lament uh, the the negative side of fandom. But the easiest way to to actually combat it is to be positive. Right. And 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 again, there's a difference between being like a Pollyanna and not being objective. And, and as someone who critiques the industry, you have to be objective and, and be willing to say when you think something doesn't hit the mark. But the vast preponderance of what you should put out there would be things you're loving, because if you're not loving what you're reading and what you're consuming, then what's the point of being a fan of it? Totally. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely agree. And I think it's it's always a fine line. But I, I do think that, I mean, honestly, like, you know, you're on the podcast. Because, I mean, I honestly don't even know how we started talking. I presume Twitter or something. But I mean, and then like Declan, like I've hung out with Declan. I've had dinner with Declan. And it's like it's because of sorry for putting you on blast, Declan, but we had dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyways, it, it's like, you know, it's I wouldn't have met, uh, you know, any of these people that I'm, you know, friendly or friends with now because because of all that. And I think it's partially because of you know, putting those good vibes out into the world. I will say too, you know, w- one thing I think is really cool too, is just seeing all the support like comic shops have gotten during all this too, because they're obviously another figure in, in, in the pandemic that has been affected r- r- quite a bit. Shouts to Matthew Rosenberg. Matthew Rosenberg has ordered from 58 shops this year. That's phenomenal. I didn't know that. Wow. That, that's great. Yeah. He just s- said that to me on Twitter recently. And I was like, my mm-hmm. God, I think I've ordered from like seven. I feel like I'm totally slacking, but you know, you, you did start touching on one of the main points of the conversation here, and and that's that this year has been seemingly, you know, I talked to some reps and they were saying that interest was through the roof in original art in, in all phases of it. And I'm curious as to, you know, you said that a lot of it is people like you, the patrons, who want to support the freelancers in this tough conventionless year. Mm-hmm. But is it more than that? Like, why do you think the, or how do you think the market has changed during the pandemic? And why do you think that is? Yeah. Well, I think we'll have to unpack this. Like you said, I mean, certainly I think the, uh, the premise that you're alluding to is that are there more than one factor? Absolutely. Um, but I will say that I think what you're seeing is uh, in as much as this year has been an accelerant, um, the pandemic has been the main reason for that acceleration, but I think it was more like um, a compounding effect of all there already being a few uh, accelerants that were underway in the last few years. Right. Um, so, number one, as we talked about, um, the convention scene and the Internet allowed over the last 10 years artists to finally come to the realization, because, frankly, a lot of artists are very, very modest and uh have our their own toughest critics the fact is david most artists were criminally underselling the value of their own time and artistry for decades yep um you know again I, as much as i am considered a, a an active and, and known collector uh there are people who literally have collections worth hundreds of millions of dollars now because for a little more than they were the only people buying art back in the 70s, right? <laughs> like when it when when it was something that people never thought to do. And you hear these stories about how people paid $50 for Jack Kirby splash pages and $100 for a Watchmen page and and it, your jaw just drops, but 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 I think the the point being is that is that the internet like with all things has has become this democratized place. There's no way that I would ever have been able to buy a page from Eduardo Risso right. um, in the past because he doesn't live here. But now I can email him or go to his website and say, hey, I'd love to buy a page from you. And because of the wonders of internet transactions, it's it's as simple as that, right? So, so, so the internet has democratized it. Uh, I also think that the convention scene, as you know, has exploded over the last decade, at least pre-pandemic. Um, and with that, the way for artists uh, and not just not artists, but writers as well to monetize their their own brand. Um, and then because of that, we've seen a real evolution of the reps. We mentioned a few already, but the the, the comic artist reps situation has changed dramatically, too, where a lot of reps um, were were often like a lot of of, of comic book store owners where it was almost like quant of a quasi hobby. They, they, they weren't in it fully for, for the idea of building a real business. They just had a few buddies that they were friends with artists and said, I'll help you sell your art. 
Um, but that's changed a lot in the last decade. And now we have this this collection. Um, and, and there are many others that we haven't mentioned. But this collection of, of real business people, small business people, entrepreneurs that run these things in a professional way, tight inventory, great SEO, great marketing, super hard work ethics, uh, you know, creative marketing ploys. Um, and it's just it's kind of this the machine. It's become institutionalized now. And, and really at the core of it is a lot of people telling artists and proving to them, you guys are not charging enough for your work. Like you, you are worth more than this. And then, and then I know I'm being long winded, but then the other part of this is that um, the auction scene, which is not really about commissions. I know we've talked a lot about commissions so far, but the, like for the, for published pages yeah. has exploded. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but, but which we probably don't have the time to get into, but the conclusion, the, the salient point here is that, um, for a long time, comic book published pages like interior art and, and covers were considered lowbrow by art collectors more generally. That changed in the last three to five years. You can debate whether it, but but really in the last three to five years, we've crossed the chasm where there are now literally an entire new world of obscenely wealthy people across the world who aren't even, believe it or not, necessarily comic book fans but are art collectors or believe in the value of collecting art that have come to the conclusion that uh, that that published art, particularly stuff with provenance or potential to have provenance, is worth paying fine art prices for. And, and generally speaking, once you cross that chasm, you don't ever go back. And so we have seen exponential growth at the high end of the market. And then underlying that, we've seen commission prices skyrocket, but I would argue justifiably so. Um, just simple math, like simple math. And I've gotten into many debates, which I regret getting into over on the internet about this, because, you know, sometimes it's like silly. Why if you ask yourself, why am I getting into these arguments? With people? <laughs> but um, I'm a member of a bunch of different collecting groups on Facebook and the like. And, 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 and those tend to have a range of collectors ranging from very experienced to new to new collectors. And often I'd say once every month or two, you'll get someone posting. I really love artists so and so, but I can't believe what they charge for commission. They're crazy. I'm just going to go get a commission from this person instead. And I always jump in and try and politely say, number one, it's your prerogative. You should never pay for something that you don't think is worth it to you. But two, you shouldn't have animus that the person that you th presumably love their art and you love their work, why would you be mad at someone that you you enjoy? Why wouldn't you be happy for them that they can make a better living because they can charge that much for your work? And it's really about supply and demand. If if And I'll use Scotty or Declan because we've talked about them and they're personal friends. If Scotty's going to be at a convention and he has the time, the physical time to draw five commissions that weekend, all he needs is to charge a price where he has five people that want to pay him for that commission, right? What good does it do him to charge a price where there are 2,000 people at that convention that want to pay that price if he can only draw five pieces? Right. So so where artists have gotten much, much smarter, and yeah, it's uh, listen, it sucks if you're a newbie collector on a budget, but they've gotten much, much smarter at understanding the value of their time. They have X time to draw X pieces. And they should charge whatever it costs so they'll have a marginal demand to meet that, right? That That's really as simple as that. Well, and I do think, you know, it, it sounds like your ultimate point for all of this is it's really the product. It's not just the pandemic. It's the product of all of the things that have been happening in, in like the stew of the market over the last, you know, decade or so that have kind of driven this up. But I do think that, you know, in regards to the art reps too, mm -hmm. I think one value to that is – First, it helps their people. It helps them understand their value. But on top of that, I, I think, you know, artists talk, you know, people at conventions talk. Oh, it, absolutely. Yeah. It, it helps even people who are independent without an art rep contextualize the value of their own work. And I think that there's a lot of value to that. But I do, you know, I do want to actually want to talk about that higher end, like the original art pages and everything like that. Sure. Because I have I have a a relative contextual I or topic that you know I, w I want to bring up in regards to this. My friend runs the sports cards department of my local comic book shop. Okay, and during all of this, sp during the pandemic, sports cards have just absolutely skyrocketed in value, like insanely. They have, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and it's really fascinating. When I was talking to him, he was saying that a lot of the drive in that market has come from a surprising group of buyers. Uh, Sports betters in 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 that regard. Um, yeah, there are people who are traditional like investors who are mm -hmm. used to buying stocks and mm -hmm. instead are buying sports cards as a potential, uh, you know, high profit, uh, high margin, you know, effort. And then on top of that, the international market has exploded. 
And I'm interested, like, do you, and I, I think th- then beyond that, there's like the underlying level of, there's been a lot more interest in the market because during tough times, people retreat to nostalgia, people retreat to comfort. And for people, whether it's comic art or if it's sports cards, there is a lot of baked in feelings to those things. And a lot of those people have more available money because they're staying home. They're not doing anything. How do you think, though, like, do you think that there is some level of that to what's going on with the boom in original art? A hundred percent. I mean, I'm, I, this is an audio podcast, so people can't see. I've just been nodding my head as you've been, have been putting out these, these factors. I think all of them are part of this primordial stew that have created the current situation. Um, I think it has been a very tough time for the world and I mean, our country certainly, but the world, uh, I think nostalgia really drives this industry at its most base level, right? I mean, you, you know that as well as I do. Um, being a comic book fan, much less art, it's about nostalgia. It's about our love for these characters and these stories and this medium that uh, do evoke a, a different time in our lives. Um, so I think that's very much a part of it. Uh, the international scene cannot be um, cannot be underreported, especially, again, if we're talking about the high-end market, like the, the jaw-dropping pieces you may see an article about. Um, for, for, for those listening that are wondering where these pieces where you generally there, there are a number of art auction sites, but, but the, the two that generally deal with, uh, with comic art and, and, uh, the like are heritage, uh, which is a New York based, uh, place. And then comic link, those would be the two and they have monthly auctions, but, but they, but where you're going to see these legendary pieces come up for auction if they're going to, I was going to say, didn't heritage just have a big one. I'm trying to remember. Anyways, sorry. That, that's yeah, yeah, no, no. Well, they, they, they. Heritage just had a major. Um, um, they have a once every quarter. They have a, an auction where like the highest end pieces go, and um, that yeah, the, the Heritage is is always the place where the biggest pieces go. They just had a Frazetta um, that went for over a million dollars. Um, a number of other pieces, but but we've broken the seven figure mark now in in in, in terms of auction pieces. But yeah, so so international is massive. Um, there is a and, and and frankly, a lot of it comes from uh from 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 East Asia. And part of that is is financial. Uh, many uh, there are many people that have gotten quite wealthy, particularly in in, in mainland China over the last decade or, or so. And um, there are tough restrictions about their ability to expat their money to diversify their money out of out of out of China, uh, out of Chinese banks or Chinese companies. And one of the ways they can do that is to buy hard assets uh, outside of the country. So that's been a huge thing. Um, uh, and then also the 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 other the only I agree with all the factors you mentioned, but the other factor we haven't mentioned, which I also think is a big part of this, is that the people that are most nostalgic for this stuff have gotten older, yeah. <laughs> and with that, have enough por- a, a, a large enough portion of them have gotten wealthy enough to collect, right? So, so let's be honest. I mean, in, in my line of work, there are people f- that that run funds far larger than I do, but they're still people in their 40s and 50s that grew up reading these these characters or these comics right and so if you look like 10 15 years ago there was a discussion of would would the published pages for the bronze age ever uh, reach the heights of what the golden and silver age pages commanded and 10 15 years ago a lot of very smart people would have said you know no it's you know not not the same it's a different time not as important historically well they were dead wrong uh, those those pages have have in many cases uh, exceeded what the golden age and, and silver age pages brought. Why? Because the people that are really wealthy now and have the capacity to spend on that stuff, their thing was bronze age. Like that was the stuff they cared about, right? Like, like they, they cared about Frank Miller and, and, and Watchmen and right. Like, and, and burn Superman and, 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 and Claremont and, and burn X-Men. It was, that was what, what that they were most nostalgic for. So they're willing to pay the price. So yeah, all the factors you mentioned in combination with the age, the, just the demographic of that populace, um, I think all have created this magic, this magic formula right now. And, and I don't know if you're going to ask this, but, but you brought up the trading card thing. A lot of people say, is it a bubble? I can't really answer that. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I, we'll know that only in retrospect, but I will say that, that the way I approach it is, uh, and, and this goes for if you're looking to become a new collector and just buy a piece or two a year or you're you're looking to to maybe be a little more aggressive. My rule of thumb has always been I've literally never purchased a piece of art uh, or a collectible comic or whatever that I didn't buy because I wanted to have it and love it. Right. Um, I've never once personally and again, everybody's mileage may vary, but I've never personally bought something on the premise that it would return an investment, uh, a return on my investment and that I could sell it for a, a much higher price. Now, as it turns out, if you collect for as long as, as a lot of us have 
and you, you, you buy as much stuff as I have. Of course, there's lots of things that theoretically are worth considerably more than I paid for them. And my wife and kids will benefit from that when I keel over someday. You know, that's they'll they'll be the ones who benefit from that. The astonishing thing is there's some artists who actually keep their pages and don't sell them. And oh, at sure, some yeah. point they're going to be like, I'm trying to remember, like, I think Chris Somney has kept a lot of his stuff and hasn't yes. sold it. Mm-hmm. And I know that Sean Murphy was keeping his Batman stuff, which will eventually make him a very, 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 very rich person. Mm-hmm. And so, like, that stuff is really interesting. Well, I mean, Walt Simonson is the is the holy grail for me in that regard. Walt Walt has sold almost none of his work ever, and he has it all. He's, he's he has it all. So so at some point, I, I presume. I honestly, I, I I've met Walt and Wheezy several times, but I don't know his family situation. I don't know if he has heirs, but I presume at this point, given their ages, he has no intention of, or need to sell them. So uh, someone will be the beneficiary. Maybe he's going to go donate in the charity for all I know. But but there'll be the legendary Thor run will be available to collectors at some point. And um, yeah, I mean, that's to your point there. There are many, many artists that, uh, that, that, that have kept either all of their pages or a collection of their pages uh, from a, a particularly special work. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny that you mentioned Holy Grail because when I was writing down notes for this, I was going to ask you what your Holy Grail piece or artist was. And I was like, I can't believe I wrote Holy Grail instead of white whale. That was the more obvious one. <laughs> Gosh, I mean, it it is a it is a running list. I can't think there's there's not necessarily one thing. And and honestly, uh, I, if you would ask me this a few years ago, the answer would have been um, a Rob Liefeld Domino splash page. And then again, that's it? just because yeah, I mean, I, I am I am. There are many things I won't put a qualifier on, but I can definitively say I'm the world's largest Domino collector. Right? That is a I, 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 if someone has more Domino art than I do, I would love to meet them. But I think I would have known about them by now. And um, yeah, and obviously for those that don't know, Rob Liefeld created Domino along with a bunch of other characters in that time, you know, Cable and, and a bunch of the other mutants that, that everybody knows today. And um, I, I got to know Rob over the years through – really through Twitter, much like you were saying. Um, we we kind of started talking on Twitter, and I didn't have a piece from him, and it was just one of those serendipitous things where – uh, at one of these auctions, a splash page from one of her first appearances where she it's a full page splash for her came up. And and, and these days, everybody kind of knows your peccadillos when you're in the community. I got probably 100 texts and, and links. Oh, did you see the page that's available? And we were at a, uh, a, 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 a fundraising event. I was at with my wife that night. <laughs> I would already had a few cocktails and I walked up to her and I showed her the listing and I said, uh, hun, I am buying this art and she said isn't it an auction i'm like that's why i'm telling you i'm telling you that i am buying this page regardless of of what it comes down to but uh so i was fortunate enough to secure that page um and and that really was kind of the the holy grail for me in terms of of, of published art uh you know uh, are there pieces i'd love to have of course i i don't own a a claremont burn x-men page i don't own an alan davis excalibur page and, and those are available out there in the world um, my favorite artist of all time uh, is John Buscema. Mm. I'm fortunate enough to own a John Buscema Avengers page, but I would love to own a. It, it doesn't have many prominent uh, classic Avengers characters on it. I'd love to own that. Um, and then there are a number of, of 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 artists, modern artists, who I don't yet have a commission from that I very much uh, hope to at some point. Um, I, I do not have an Art Adams piece. Uh, I would very much like to remedy that. I don't have a Raphael Grampa piece. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, and the great thing about art or any kind of, 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 obsession is there, there are always new artists that I'm falling in love with their work. And so there'll always be something that I I'm excited about trying to chase down. I want to put this in your brain. If you ever see the cover art to daredevil number eight, let me know. Stilt man's first appearance. If, 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 uh, if I have a domino, it's stilt man. And yes, no, I know that. Okay, sure. Yeah. That's my corner. I, I probably not, couldn't not, afford it because it's Wally Wood, but at the right. same time, I would be a very, very happy man if I could acquire that because I, I will certainly make a mental note of that. And I will say, I don't know if you ever uh, buy any toys or not. I'm not much. Oh, no, guy, I know about the toy. Okay. I've been sent that so many times and I am one of my listeners and subscribers actually suggested that they create a crowdfunding platform called Go Stilt Me for me, where they just buy like unbelievable amounts of those hand toys so I can make the tallest stilt man possible. Um, I'm very, I'm very excited for that, but I do, I, I want to go back like the, the thing about the age that, that you mentioned, I do think it's fascinating. I remember talking to, I don't remember who it was, but we were talking about the X-Men and about how it's, you know, the people who are writing X-Men are always kind of responding to the X-Men of their generation. So it's like, you could see like when blue and gold oh, was sure. coming out, 
when X Men Blue and Gold, the, the actual titled books from a few years ago were coming out. That was obviously people from the generation who were all about the nineties, right. and and I think you see that in really like every market. I mean, here's a great example. This week. I've been selling old Pokemon cards, which hilariously, I knew nothing about the market. I found out later that apparently it is like an insanely hot market and people who collect Pokemon cards are insane and want to give me lots of money, which is great. But at the same time, it is it was much crazier than I expected. I think that, you know, that is a very underrated element about this because it's that's such a driver that, I mean, like the, the people, I mean, I remember I had, I had this comic book garage sale last year where this guy came to my comic book garage sale and he loved comics when he was a kid, but he gave up collecting them and now he owns his own business and he has money. And so he was just there to find some of his favorite appear- first appearances from when he was a kid. And, you know, like that's, that's the type of thing that happens in original art now. And I'm not trying to make it sound like this is like an unachievable, like, impossible to enter market but at the same time it's like that is that is a super underrated aspect to this the people who love these characters and loved all this art when they were a kid or when they were younger now have the money to acquire that and that the value or the importance of that cannot be understated that's huge yeah i i definitely agree with what you're saying and and, and i'm remembering now you asked me a, a, a question earlier in the chat which I, I think I partially answered, which was, you know, how do it's daunting for people. How do they get into it? I mean, I think the answer is there really is the industry is open for all types of things, right? Like, yes, if, if you if you're listening to this and you've never bought a piece of art before and you're in your 40s like I am, I don't know if I think you're in your 30s, but um, but but and just we're burn Claremont and you think, man, I'd love to earn a burn Claremont X-Men page. All right. You know, admittedly, I don't, I hate to break it to you. You're probably not going to do it, right? Like not anytime soon because it's, it's going to, first of all, you're going to have to find someone that wants to sell the ones they already own because they're already owned by everybody. But, and you're going to have to pay tens of thousands of dollars at a minimum, right? So that's probably not in your offing. But if you're a burn X-Men fan and you love those characters, there are absolutely artists right now that, yeah, maybe maybe they're not expensive yet because they haven't gotten on a Marvel or a DC book yet or they haven't had a big image hit. But you can come across them on Instagram. You can come across them on Twitter. Um, you can you can join Facebook groups that are about collecting sketches and art. And there are tens of thousands of people that are in there having conversations and showing off their wares. And you can get an amazing drawing of those characters that ev- that evoke the same nostalgia. And yeah, is it the same? No, it's it's a different type of experience. But that's the cool thing. I mean, I think for people that are curious, I mean, I routinely uh, buy commissions from people I literally had never heard of until I came across their work on Instagram and thought, oh, I like their style. And they're not published yet, or maybe they've put out one indie book on their own and they're just trying to make it in the industry. And I will gladly purchase something from them just because I like their art and I want to support them. And maybe some of them never make it in the industry or they move on from the industry and, 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 and you, the name never means anything in the pantheon of the comics industry, but it's still a great piece of art with a character or characters that I, that I have a personal affinity for. And that's really, I think where everybody should start, you know? Um, and you had mentioned with the Felix thing with Stuart Immonen, it's funny because uh, for, for really the most, most of the time that, that, that comic art has been a thing, uh, it was generally assumed that the published page was worth more than a commission. Um, and, and and the reason for that, right, is that there, it's a page that actually was part of a comic. So it's, it's theoretically more important and more historically significant. But in many cases, particularly with modern creators, that has been flipped on its head, thanks to a litany of the factors that we've already talked about and also that they have great reps who have built a market for them. But um, I would say most artists today – that command really high commission prices are getting more for a commission than you can than you can get for their published pages. So I get a lot of questions like the other way around these days, like where they say, oh, I just can't afford, let's say, a Daniel Warren Johnson commission, right? Like I, I love him, but I just can't afford him. Well, guess what? You can probably buy a Daniel Warren Johnson published page for much less than you would char- he would charge you for a commission. And you, it's an amazingly rendered, fully detailed piece. So it's funny that the, the, we've gone full circle there where it's actually in many cases and imminent is another great example. It's actually more affordable if you are on a budget to get a published page from a lot of these creators than it is to have them do a custom piece for you. Well, and and that makes sense because I mean, I think there's two main things there. First, it's already a piece that exists rather than they have to find time for it. And like somebody like, um, you know, Stuart, for example, Stuart probably, I mean, I cannot imagine he does a lot of commissions. I don't even know if he ever does commissions. But on top of that, 
when you the difference between a commission and like an original like so let's say you know daniel daniel i love murder falcon but the fandom of a murder falcon original art page is going to be far lower than the fandom of danny warren johnson drawing star wars stuff and like that's that's part of the i mean honestly i'm I'm not saying star wars was all of it but the, the fact that daniel can draw some really crazy amazing star wars stuff i think was a big part of the reason why he became such a gigantic sensation in commission the commission world anyways the fact that commissions can be anything versus original art pages are only the one thing that they are. I think that probably, and, and that these artists are big deals. I think that that probably plays a part in the calculus as well. Oh, absolutely. No, a hundred percent. And and that's a perfectly fine example. Um, and then the other thing too is, and it gets back to this idea that artists finally in the last decade have, have been conditioned to understand their own value is that even though it was always published page equals more important, ergo more valuable, that really probably shouldn't have been the case because number one, uh, a published page, the artist has already been compensated for. Um, now we haven't talked about covers. Covers, like the covers of comics, that art is always significantly by a multiple, you know, by many factors more valuable or more expensive to buy than an interior page. I don't ascribe to that personally. I don't buy covers for that reason. But, but that is the way that the market is. And and yet, if you're buying a cover from someone, they've already been paid by the publisher for that art, right? So so in essence, you're they're getting paid again for for the same work. Whereas a commission, as you noted, they have to take time to think up, compose, and then render that drawing just for you. So, mm-hmm. um, so, so in a way it is a, a, in many cases, depending on the type of commission, um, it, it can be more time consuming than, than, than what they're doing to sell you a page that they've already drawn and received compensation for. So, yeah, yeah, I do. You know, I had a, a patron question a talking all, you know, this, this whole conversation if you're an outsider who's not into original art or who is who's interested but has not jumped into it, I do think, you know, we may have laid a foundation of making it sound more intimidating than it is. And you've talked about the the potential of working with new artists and finding artists that, like, you know, are more up and coming that you might fit what you're trying to do better. But mm-hmm. a patron named Carl Mizell asked, what are some tips or pointers you might have for folks who are, you know, they want to start dipping their toes into the world of buying original comic art? Like, do you have any like surefire like this is a good path to go down ideas or anything like that um sure yeah i mean um okay so so let's maybe we take a step back and just quickly kind of define some terms because i realize we've been using some terms that maybe commissions and original art yeah yeah, so so a a commission is effectively meaning you are paying an artist to draw something of your own request so as people have gathered like i'll say hey would you like to draw me a domino uh, so that's what we mean by commission. You are commissioning them to draw something specific for you. Uh, then there are, you see people fold the name sketch around. Now, sketch is the same thing basically, but generally speaking, a sketch implies a bit more a more uh, quickly drawn, a little less detailed. Uh, you usually talk about sketches more at, at like a convention where an artist um, just, just may have some time while you're at the table getting maybe a book signed or saying hello to them. They'll just do a, a, a very quick rendering for you, maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, and they'll draw something very cool for you, but it won't be super tight or highly detailed. Sometimes those are even free, depending if you're, you know, you're a kid or a big fan. Sometimes they're not. In Europe, they're almost always free, by the way. So next time you're in Europe, uh, you know, go to a Comic-Con. Um, <laughs> so that's like a sketch. And then and then the published pages are exactly that. Those are pages that are drawn. They're the, they're the artwork that actually was used to make the comics that we all read and love. And then they are I mean, most of the time uh, these days they're 11 by 17 Bristol board paper and they are uh, pencils or pencils, uh, inks over pencils. And uh, and they are resold. They're sold by the, the artists get to retain that art um, thanks to the hard fought battles of artists in the 70s. And, and they get to keep that work and resell it if they want. Um, so that's what we mean in terms of like th- that stuff uh, in terms of how to do it there. It, th- Ultimately, it should be about like, what are you into? Right. So so I do think that social media is great that way. Um, there's a, a Facebook group and it's a, got a longer name than this. But if you're on Facebook and go to it and, t- and search for groups and type in sketch prices. And I haven't checked lately, but I think they have like 11, 12, 13,000 members. Wow. And it's very well moderated, though, which I give them the credit because you get that many people in, in a place and it can get unwieldy. But they're very tightly moderated. They have a lot of moderators. And the whole rule is very simple. You can post art there, but you can only post art that that. Uh, you have to post the price mm. and that's very helpful for, especially for young collect for new collectors. So if I bought a piece from Mike Norton, I recently got a piece from, him. if I were to post it in there, I would post the scan say, Oh, here's a cool 
Domino and Phantom X commission I got from Mike Norton, and I would have to post what I paid for it. And so that's very good because you can go to places like that and you can just do a quick search, like if you're into Batman, and you can see lots of, you'll sure you'll see a Jim Lee Batman that someone spent five thousand dollars on, but you'll see an artist that you've literally never heard of, and it's a great rendering, and you think that looks awesome, and maybe it's eighty bucks, and you're thinking, oh, that's great. And generally speaking, either the artists themselves will post their wares there and say, you can contact me this way, this way, or this way. Or, and as I do when I post, I'll, I'll say, oh, and if you're interested in this, this is their, this is who reps them, or this is where you can find them on Instagram and reach out to them. So I think that's helpful. Also, if you're a user of Twitter or Instagram, uh, I assume you're familiar with the idea of like keyword searches out there, but you can do hashtag searches and search for commissions or open for commissions or comic art and just take treat it like you're browsing. Just browse through and see what's out there. And again, you'll be overwhelmed by how many amazing artists are out there that, that aren't necessarily name brand in the comic industry yet. Um, th those are really the easiest ways to discover. And then to, for me, I mean, I think it's invaluable and this can be tough, I realize, but going to a convention is super is super helpful. Because every convention, whether it's small or massive, have what's called an artist alley. And an artist alley is basically just a series of tables that uh, artists are, are get to sit up and, and, and be there for to meet fans and to sign work, but also to peddle their art and their books and their tchotchkes. And you can meet them and you get a, a sense for the scene. And you can also walk around and see what they're selling and how much they're charging. So those are the ways to do it. And the other thing is just ask, right? I mean, I know way more about the industry now because I met other collectors that were more experienced or savvy, Felix being one. I mean, Felix is, aside from being one of the best art reps out there, has an incredible jaw-dropping personal collection. And we actually met at an artist table. We were at Chicago, uh, we were at C2E2. I was getting Nick Patara to sign uh, a page that I had bought uh, from him. Um, and and Felix was standing there also doing the same. And Felix said, oh, can I see your portfolio? And I just thought it was some random guy, just, you know, oh, a fellow collector. And I, I let him see my portfolio. And and he looked through it. And he's very complimentary. And I had no idea at the time that this is a guy that owns the cover of, of Dave Stevens' Rocketeer number one and the cover to, 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 to you know, uh, like, to, you know, owns – pages from dark Knight. I'm like, Oh, this guy likes my collection. That's cool. Not knowing that I was standing next to a guy who I would just have died to look at his portfolio. Right. So I just think it's about having conversations. And, and, and one of the cool things about comics fandom, whether it be your show or your community that you've built or, or our show and our, or things like, like Twitter is it is a community. People generally aren't, um, there is a whole nother side of all this. We aren't talking about where, yeah, it's like kind of cutthroat and people are trying to to, to invest or like, or gobble these high end pieces from each other and outbid each other because they think they can flip it. And, and I'm not into that scene at all. So I can't even really speak to it. But for the most part, I mean, a lot of this is just about people bigging up each other and wanting to share. Like, I'm never going to, like, I don't hoard artists when I discover someone and I get a piece of them. I don't never, I don't like refuse to mention them on, on online because I, I don't want else to, I, I share and say, hey, look at this amazing piece that this artist did for me, and and you should get a piece from them too. And I, so I think it is it is not as daunting as it may feel. And also, there's no right or wrong answer, right? Mm -hmm. like there, there's no there's there's no there's no way that 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 this can go wrong as long as you understand that it's just ultimately should be about getting something that you're satisfied with. Yeah, I think the thing that people forget about involving this is it's. Whether you're talking about going up to an artist at Artist Alley and talking to them or approaching them on social media or talking to collectors and everything like that, just like a whole lot of comics fandom, I mean, it's a community. And the community, like, if if you put yourself out there, I, I don't know, like, sometimes I, I get messages from people because my show is an interview show and they're like, how do you get the guests that you do? And I'm like, I ask. I mean, that's, that's it. For sure. For sure. I mean, yeah. part of it is is, like, realizing that you know, not, not putting people on a pedestal, not, not looking at Felix as like some unapproachable person because he owns Dark Knight pages or not looking at, you know, Daniel Warren Johnson as somebody that's unapproachable because he posts like event comic commissions or anything like that. I mean, I, I mean, in the sense that like it is like anytime one of his pieces drops, it is staggering just to see oh, absolutely. it. Absolutely. Sure. And it's it's just about putting yourself out there. And, and, and I think that that's that's really great because. It's it's the circle of comics. It's like you love these people, you love their their art, and you know by getting a commission from them or buying an original art page, you're helping them. You are making their life easier, and that's like a, a mutually beneficial relationship. And so I don't know. I, I just I, I think that's what's really cool about all of this stuff is it's everybody helping everybody. Everybody wins here. 
Definitely. And and if I could, I mean, just a few quick pointers maybe to the to newbie collectors, like just a few things that uh, you'd better to hear me say and th- then have to learn the hard way, which I did. Is the first one, don't buy Domino? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. Although I must admit, I do have a pang of jealousy anytime uh, I see a Domino commission online that is not mine. <laughs> uh, but that's 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 what therapy's for. Um, no, so so when you're when you're buying art, um, the 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 price posted if you're if you're dealing with with published pages and you're dealing with a dealer right now. Now we talked about reps. Now a rep is someone like a Felix or a Paolo or a Jason who are are work for the artists and and help them manage their their whole art scene, including selling their pages and arranging commissions. But like there are also dealers, right? Like your Albert Moyes, mm-hmm. your Romita Mans, and they have incredible, massive, thousands upon thousands of existing pages that they own basically personally, and then they sell them. Um, now those guys, they're old school. They're more than willing, and in fact, live for the haggle, right? So if you go to an Albert Moy or Romita Man, and uh, and presuming you have you know the budget available. Uh, they want to negotiate. So if you see a price, they're not going to be offended if you say, I will give you X percent of that price. They may tell you to, to go screw, but my point is, is they're, they're not going to be offended by the haggle. OK, but when you go to a convention or you reach out to someone online and let's say you just find an artist that you like and say, hey, are you open for commissions? That's the way you should always approach this, by the way. If you're going to an artist directly uh, and you, you can you find a way to contact them, just feel free. Reach out to them, send them a DM or whatever they say is the best way to contact them. By all means, say, hey, I love your work. Uh, are you taking commissions? That's that's it. Then if 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 you know if they have the time available and it's a channel that they use, they will likely hit you back. Um, you know, maybe give them some time. It depends on how busy they are. But they'll hit you back and they'll say, "Oh, thanks a lot. I'm I'm not available for commissions right now, but here's a newsletter that you can sa- subscribe and I'll let you know when I am." Or thanks a lot. I'm not available right now, but I will be at cons next year. Or they'll hopefully hit you back and say, "Oh, hey, yeah, thanks for hitting me up. I I have a availability." Here are my rates, and they will give you a list of rates, and that will range in terms of I will do you know I will do a a nine by twelve for you for X price if you want eleven by seventeen X price if you want multiple characters it's this much more. Um, don't don't haggle with them on that. Like that is this is their this is their this is their rate. Um, I'm not saying there's not like artists out there that aren't okay with haggling, but but generally speaking, you're gonna offend them, and, and, and it's like you know going to your place of business, whatever your your stock and trade is. You have a rate that you feel you've earned because of your reputation, your quality. That's what that is. So just respect those rates. If they're more expensive than you're comfortable with, there's nothing at all wrong with saying, in fact, I've done this many times in my life where you you ask an artist if they're available. They say yes. They give you their rates. There's absolutely nothing wrong with just honestly responding saying, geez, thanks so much. It's a little out of my price range right now. But boy, I hope at some point I've, you know, I have the the money saved up. I'd love to, to get something from you later. And they will totally be fine and say, I understand, you know, good luck. It's thank you for being a fan of my work. Yeah. So just honest, open communication. So that's the other thing. And same thing with reps, like reps aren't going to give you discounts. Some reps will give you a discount if you are a frequent buyer or you buy a lot, right? It's just like going to a comic store. If you go to a comic store and you you, you have a hundred issues on your monthly pull list, they're probably going to give you a discount. If you go to a rep and you, you buy, you're, you're looking to buy five or 10 pages. Yeah. They'll probably offer you a discount. Um, but, but it's not like you can be like, oh, Hey, uh, I see you're asking $500 for that page. I'll give you 200 and they're just going to politely say, no, thank you. Um, so that's the, that, that's like the basic in terms of the economics. The other pointer is you have to, and this is definitely happens to most new collectors. You have to be a little upfront and understanding about the, the timing of a commission request. Okay. Oh, you mean like how long it takes? Yeah. Like, um, like so, so artists generally speaking are freelancers. They again, aren't making huge livings. There are going to be situations where they maybe take your request and then get a gig that they weren't expecting to get, and they have to do that gig. And uh, but that being said, there's nothing wrong with you as the commissioner defending yourself and your right to get your piece. But like, do it politely, right? So my rule of thumb, because I get a lot of creators hit me up and say, or a lot of collectors hit me up and say, "Hey, Jay, like I, I commissioned this artist, and I know you've gotten stuff from them, but it's been six months, and I don't know." And my thing is always, as long as the lines of communication are open. Don't panic, right? And you set you should set the, the expectation. If you commission someone, you sh- you just it's okay. You should say up front, like, "Hey, uh, what's the turnaround time on this? Do you think?" And they'll tell you, "Hey, uh, I'm doing. I'm going to bang them out all this month. You know, I have a, a, a I'm in between books. I'm going to do them all this month." Or they'll say, "Well, as you know, I'm doing Superman right now, so uh, I hope to get them done by the end of the year." And so, number one, like, it's totally okay for you to say. I'm I'm not comfortable with those terms. I don't want a piece right now. But if you if you if you're comfortable with the terms up front, then stick to that, right? Like if a person says to you, 
I might not be able to get this done for about six months. Don't two months later complain online that they're not getting the piece to you, right? Like just play fair in that regard. Yeah. But then also totally we're you're all adults. This is a business transaction. There's nothing wrong with pinging somebody, especially if it's near or at where you thought you were going to get the piece and say, hey, just checking in. What's the deal? And there's also nothing wrong with if you feel like the piece is taking too long or they're not getting back to you to ask for a refund. Mm -hmm. Like if you've already paid for a portion, there's nothing wrong with that. And and only then, like if they've if they've stopped communicating with you or they're rude to you or they're not offering you a refund, only then I think then it's very fair and reasonable to to express your frustration publicly about that, because then they're not then they're not being very genuine. And and I will tell you again, I've I've as you noted, I've 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 purchased or commissioned hundreds of pieces over the years, and I can count on two hands the experiences that I would deem to have been like extremely negative where I've, I've essentially asked for my money back. So we're talking less than one half of a percent of the experiences I've ever had. I would consider a negative experience. And part of it is because I learned very early on to just set expectations on both sides. What are they expecting in terms of timeline and level of detail and communication? And what am I expecting? And as long as you're both upfront about that, you'll be fine. Yeah. So long story short, being an adult, yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. No, for sure. And, and, and listen, artists will, there are plenty of artists that listen to your show. They, one of the reasons reps are great is that a lot of artists mean well, but they take on more than they can chew. Yeah. Plenty of artists, especially at cons. The classic thing is you go to a convention back when we actually had conventions before the pandemic and an artist will take a list on Friday. They'll say, Oh yeah, I'm taking a commission list. And that list will fill up very quickly and they'll suddenly have 20 commissions on their list. And they'll not have the time to do those 20 commissions. And then you as a collector need to be upfront with them and say, hey, um, you know, I, I, I need the piece by the end of the weekend. That's my expectation. And and if, if it's not done by then, you have to establish that you want a refund. And right. that's totally fine. If you if you if they say to you on Sunday afternoon, hey, I didn't get a chance to do my commission, your commission. Can I mail it to you? Understand that you if you say yes to that are taking on a much greater risk. Yeah. That you're going to be waiting a long time or get lost in the ether. And that's where that I would say 90 percent of the bad commission experiences are that very thing where you're at a commit convention. You ask for a piece at the convention. It's not done. And they say, can I mail it to you? And you say, sure. And it turns into three, six, 12 months, two years, never. And that's where I think as, as a fan, unless you're really plugged into the scene uh, like we are, where you can kind of like keep tabs on them. Um, I would recommend being very careful about letting them mail you a commission that you thought you were getting that weekend. Yeah. I will say in regards to haggling, I've haggled before, Jason. I've haggled up. I've actually convinced artists to take more money because sometimes they undervalue themselves. I'm sure you've experienced that many times as well. But Oh, absolutely. It's yeah, absolutely. It's, it's wild. But all right, well, let's close. I want to close with some stuff about 11 o'clock comics because... Oh, right on. Um, because, you know, it's it's honestly like... You guys, you, okay, I'm going to try to, uh, Vince B, Vince Bonavolia. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, David A. Price, it's you three talking about comics every week. And I mean every week. This is the thing that blows my mind. Okay. You've done 706 episodes as of yes. the posting of this episode, I believe, right? Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is an unreal number. But the thing that really blows my mind, if if I remember, you told me this before, and it's possible this streak was broken, but I doubt it. You post, you have not missed a week. That's right. Yeah, that is our our claim. To, uh, that is How? that is our claim. How? How? Yeah, it, it's 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 a badge of honor, and it's become kind of like uh, Rapunzel with the hair, where we we really do believe in our hearts, and we're not generally superstitious people. But if we did miss a week, it almost end the show. We started in May of two thousand and eight, and we've never missed a week. Now, uh, as as I think you know, we 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 also have a a, pat a Patreon, and and so part of our Patreon is at a certain threshold, which we're fortunate enough to have been at that threshold for a long time. Uh, we provide six episodes a month. So we've done six episodes a month for two plus years, but to your point, since inception, so going on close to thirteen years, we've never missed a week. Mm -hmm. That's that is astonishing. That is like <laughs> I don't know. I mean, granted, I, I will say this: I, I'm not trying to you know like give myself too much credit, but having you know having to book people every single week that can be tough. But you guys have what is it? Your, your set date every Thursday, right? Yeah, I mean, part of it is, and, and comparing your show and mine, obviously, one of, one of the big differences you noted is you you are an interview show, and, and frankly, the best, I think, in the business. Thank you. Uh, and and part of that is you are subject to having to find 
someone that's able to in their schedule to, to talk to you each week. So so for you, it's it is almost impossible to guarantee that kind of regularity. But, yeah, for us, it's it's we do interviews. As you know, we have we've been fortunate to have a lot of pretty amazing people on the show, but we're not an interview show for, for those that aren't familiar with our show. Um, David, Vince and I are it's basically a variety show for comics podcasting. It's 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 long. Just for, for full disclosure, our episodes average about three hours. That's so <laughs> not, great, not great for SEO. SEO doesn't like that. But but yes, we're about three hours long and um, it runs the gamut. I mean, we talk about anything from a theme show about the Filipino masters of the 70s to uh, an image orama where we're going through 20 different image comics to uh, to an interview with Roy Thomas. I mean, it's, it's literally uh, there is no uh, there's no definitive plot or plan in terms of what we talk about um it's whatever we feel like talking about and about half of our episodes like this last one 706 are just us showing up together three great friends who love each other and love comics just talking about what we read that week and uh, letting the conversation take us where it may so it's much easier for us to maintain the schedule because uh number one it's there's there's multiple so uh, to be clear we have not all we have all not been on the show every week right and i'm the most egregious absentee if if it were up to me i we wouldn't have that 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 consistency because i i do take off more than they do for either work purposes or because i have three three kids and a wife and that sort of thing but um but yes collectively it's easy for at least two of us to be there uh and we'll have people sit in with us uh, when one of us are out kind of like your uh you know your joan rivers uh (laughs) fill in there or something Mm -hmm. um um, we've been joking, actually, Tony Fleece, the comic creator, he's become like my fill in and that bums me out because I love when Tony's on and I'm on, but it seems like every time I'm not going to be on the show, they, they grab Tony to, to jump in for me. But, uh, but yeah, because we don't like have a regimented, this is what we're going to, we need to talk to X person. It's pretty easy because we literally just turn on the mics and just go. Um, and, and, and that's very fortunate. And, and I think it probably goes without saying, I'm sure you're the same. You, you love doing this or you wouldn't continue to do it. Um, and it without, it's going to get a little corny, but, but, but Vince and David actually, believe it or not, when we started the show, I didn't know David at all. Um, and I knew Vince only, I only met him, I think twice and we'd been internet friends, but, but fast forward. I mean, they are literally two of my very closest friends on the earth period, full stop. And we speak every day to each other. Mm -hmm. Um, they've become my brothers. I mean, only child, they've, they're, they're literally my brothers. I mean, I would do anything for them and I'm sure they, 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 for me. So it's just a, a real treasure. I mean, it can be the most stressful week on a personal or professional or political level. And, and it's like a calm in the storm. I know that, that on a Thursday night, we're going to get together with a few cocktails and we're going to have fun and we're going to talk about stuff that we love and enjoyed and, and, and everything else that's happening, uh, be damned. So, um, it's, it's a true pleasure. Yeah. I do think it's funny that the only time I've actually met you in a perfect storm of everything we've been talking about was with you, Vince and David in like a flying V coming at me and it was at daniel warren johnson's table full stop. it was and 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 we were we were all saying hello to each other and i was con- begrudgingly congratulating you two for making the finals of the aforementioned fantasy baseball league and uh which i was the i lost to you i believe that you're in the semifinals so which is funny because that team was actually not very good but i just had some players go on a heater and i ended up winning yep. the season and then uh-huh. last year or this year my team was I, like throughout the season just by far the best and then i happened to run into Daniel in the final who had Al- Adalberto uh, Mondesi mm-hmm. on like the hottest streak and I had drafted him and then traded him during the season at that point somebody released him and Daniel benefited from it to the point where I got tuned up I mean I just got killed killed yeah by Daniel. yeah for sure for sure no I mean for sure and that that's a lot that's a super fun league and uh all of those leagues I mean you're you're the league that you're talking about is the newest of them but we have five leagues that are associated with the podcast and uh, we call them the Greg LeClaire leagues because Greg was a longtime listener and member of our community who ran fantasy baseball leagues for the community for a long time. And then he unfortunately passed away. So we memorialize them and we call them the LeClaire leagues and we donate uh, proceeds from each league uh, in his, in his name each year um, because of uh, just in his honor. Cause he was like a diehard fantasy baseball nut. But, uh, and then let me just say one other thing. Cause I was thinking about like this, the, the narrative of the show about how we continue, how we can never miss I mean, and, and, you know, I know you get a sense of this, too. Any successful podcast does. When we started the show, I mean, we literally had no expectation of whether we get 10 people to listen to the show. It was effectively just an excuse to tell our wives, hey, uh, you got to put the kids to bed this week because we want to tonight because I'm going to talk comics with my friends. And and we we could never have imagined that we would have grown 
in in popularity in the way we did. And it's not about like the popularity part of it, but what what we could have never understood is the community. Oh yeah. Um, because as much as David and Vince are my brothers, uh, we have an, an incredibly vibrant, active community of people, and and many of these people I have had the great fortune now of 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 breaking bread with, and 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 again before the pandemic, going to multiple cons. I mean, one of our favorite cons is Heroes Cons, Heroes Con in Charlotte, and this year, uh, bef- unfortunately, it didn't happen because of the, of of COVID. We were going to have over sixty people from our EOC community. We call our podcast EOC for short, 11 O'Clock Comics. Um, 60 people, including about 20 who had never been to a convention before, were going to go and hang out at the Charlotte Weston and all together, like almost like a mini con and get together. So that part of it also is so self-sustaining because now you know, again, it's not about like X number of listeners, but it's that the people that do listen are passionate. We've become friends and we know each other's lives and we 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 share and we we, we share with they. Our listeners give me as many things to enjoy as, as I think we give them back in terms of books that I wouldn't have discovered if they had not uh, put it to me or, or even artists like, Hey, would check out this artist I found on Instagram or who just did this book for boom. And next thing I know, I'm getting a commission from them. Right. Um, my wife, again, I'm, I'm, I'm happily married for 20 years and I have three sons. Uh, they all just, it's a running joke in our home because we get packages to my home two or three times a week from listeners like who go out of their way to send me stuff, which is almost like so ridiculous when you think about it, knowing how many comics I read and buy and get comped. But like they'll say, hey, I, I saw this. I was in I was a friend. Uh, one of the li- our listeners was in Italy and came across an Italian Moby Dick bond de Sine and just had the wherewithal while they're on vacation, thought enough of me to buy this book and mail it to me. And like it makes me tear up when I think about it, because it's like. I don't know that there's many people that I would do that for like, right. that I consume their content. And it's just, it's very, very humbling and affirming. And it's, it's, it is, it has become almost this perpetual energy battery where it means so much more now than it did back then to so many people, ourselves included, that I just couldn't fathom not doing it. Yeah. I, that th- is an astonishing part of it. I actually, one of my uh, patrons uh, shouts to Mario mailed me he knows i'm a huge basketball fan and he is a diehard dallas mavericks fan i'm an indiana mm-hmm. pacers fan he mailed me a dallas mavericks shirt and he was just like you know just to be like you know i want to share my fandom with you and mario while i did burn that shirt because i'm a pacers fan not a mavericks fan <laughs> i did really appreciate it just kidding i didn't burn it uh but anyways but i mean I, that stuff is I, I just think it's amazing i had my first meetup at emerald city 2019 and yes, I was like right. horrified of the idea that no one would show up. And so I just, I go to the place. There's this cool arcade that's near, uh, or not, not, it's in Belltown in, uh, well, it was in Belltown. I don't know if it's still there, uh, near like the convention center. And I was hopeful that, you know, one person would show up. And the first person that showed up was my buddy Sebastian, Sebastian Gurner from TKO. And I was like, if Sebastian's the only person, I'm gonna be happy. And then like a whole bunch of people showed up. And it's, it is really amazing to think, about like how you know whether you're talking about original art or you're talking about podcasts or all these different things having these communities to share these things with because it's all about a mutual love of something it's all about you know loving your podcast but also loving comics and feeling like by listening to you vince and david like you've made friends like you found your people and i think that's wonderful yeah absolutely no i mean that's really what it's all about and 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 um we we just as you said we we just did episode seven hundred six so for episode seven hundred we just took questions from our listenership mm-hmm. and we got the question of uh, do you think you'll ever stop or what have you and I, my answer was well I, I I hope never but but or I can't foresee it stopping anytime soon but but if one of the other guys were to, to say for whatever reason they weren't going to do the show anymore then I said I think it would end because. I don't it, it, I said so I didn't want to be like, you know, Howard Stern and bring in Artie Lang. It was just not quite the same. It's, you know what I mean? Like like the show is us. It's it's us. And and actually, we had, we when we started the show back in the day, we had we had a fourth co-host who, who left two or three years into it. Um, but but it's 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 just become like the, the it's the collective us. And we're all very different. I mean, for those of I'm sure many of you listeners haven't listened to our show. Um, but but if you haven't, David, Vince and I are very different people with different different, you know, demographics, different walks of life, different worldviews. Uh, different comics that that we're most passionate about, but that's all kind of part of the charm, right? We have mutual respect. We can rib each other, uh, but but generally speaking, we you know we 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 what we do have is unified is is, a, is a, just a love for the hobby. Yeah, my favorite one of my favorite things about doing a podcast is the fact that um, 
my version of of David and Vince is my buddy Brandon Brandon Burpee, and he. Uh, I was I was going to make a joke that I, I I was sitting in Brandon Burpee's seat, and it felt good. <laughs> well, he's he's been on the uh, he's been the most frequent guest since the beginning. Sure. And the funny thing, he's like the chaos to my order, and it's it's like a a, a really great fit, but. One of the things that delights me the most is when comic creators ask me, when is Brandon coming on the podcast? I'm sure, yeah. And I'm just like, oh my God, I love the fact that Brandon is like the most desired guest. I was going to Brandon, if not on air, off air for sure before we hung up today. He, yeah, he's, I, I had uh, let's an X-Men artist of some note email me to let me know that they drew Maggot into, or like that Maggot appeared in one of the comics and that they wanted Brandon to know. And I was like, oh my God, Brandon, Fantastic. you're known as the Maggot Man. But, uh, for sure. Anyways, well, you know, Jason, I've I've loved this conversation. We went to all different places, but I, th- I think I'm going to wrap up there. That's all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on and talking about original art, for talking about communities, for talking about 11 o'clock comics and everything else. I really appreciate you taking the time. Hey, it, listen, it was my distinct pleasure. Again, as I, as I said to you before we started, I, I genuinely think you do amazing work. Both you're also an incredible writer for those of you that listen to his podcast, but don't but have never read his uh, his writing. David is an excellent writer, particularly when he does deep dive thought pieces, um, which I've been fortunate enough to participate in one or two of those as well. But uh, yeah, I, I think, again, um, I know you joked uh, like there are some shows that kind of like view each other as rivals. And I just think that's kind of silly in the sense that we're in an age of podcasting and uh, there are literally more people to do podcasts on the earth now than are world citizens. But uh, but, you know, everyone has their own niche audience, right? We all have I'm sure we have lots of overlap. In fact, I know we do because a bunch of people when you posted that uh, you you posted in your in your newsletter that I or your Patreon that I was going to be on the show preemptively um a, a lot of my listeners hit me up and said oh my god you're gonna be on that's like two worlds colliding but but uh i just i love the hobby and i love the community and i think that for all of the craziness of of comics and the direct market and 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 the the stuff that maybe does drive us nuts occasionally i think the coolest part about it is what other industry um do you do you have an opportunity to have such a horizontal playing field where you know you or i just because we're fans or have a microphone can become close friends with with some of those talented people on the earth and 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 also meet amazing people who like to listen to our voices and then become our friends it's it's an incredible thing and it really is one of the 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 things i most enjoy about the hobby is just how uh, how how interconnected it all is yeah absolutely thanks for listening to this week's episode of off panel with podcaster and original art collector jason wood you can find jason on twitter his incredible comic art fans page and in the weekly podcast 11 o'clock comics off panels once again brought to you by sketch.com check out sketch my subscription comic site for long form articles interviews and more and consider subscribing for access to all the site's content and its members only form if you're a fan of off panel make sure to check it out on patreon if you back the show in there you not only support it but you get early access to each week's podcast access to weekly content and more also, don't forget to subscribe to Off Panel on iTunes or Spotify and give the show a rating or review while you're at it. You can find Off Panel and Sketched on social media by liking it on Facebook at slash Sketched, that's S-K-T-E-C-H-D, follow on Twitter and Instagram at, at @sketchcomic or following me at, at slash fried gold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Brandon DePillis, Patrick Brower, Declan Shalvey, Dan Garino, Josh Williamson, Adam Freeman, Ben Wilde, Brian Klein Q, SB, Antonio Offen, Nick Bennett, Daniel Whitfield, Scott Young, Susanna Polo, Jeff Weira, Reed Hinkley of Barnes, Mario Tiambang, AbductorTheComic.com, Andrew Carita, Matt Mahoney, Charlie Chu, Stephen Hall, Pensacola Pop Comics, Kim Eslin, Phil Myra, Christian Shelton, Kenny Porter, Chris Pocello, Torn Grunbeck, Fuzz Bubbles, Chris Fata, Transmitter Down, Walls Comics and Books, Carl Mizell, Danny Ollie, Paul Slates, Akil Wilson, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dotson, Leon. Kingus, Keegan Ray, Wesley Giff, Sean Kirkham, Harry Small, Hal Ross, Julio Anta, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Paul Ryanwa, Vita Ayala, Tara Ferguson, Dave Slusher, WMQ Comics, Akil Kokachi, Phil White, Sean Pinella, Kyle Heidelman, Philip C.V., Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, Nick Michelin, David Kelly, Rob Wilson IV, Nick Plato, Owen McCready, Brendan Fletcher, Gary Maloney, Jonathan Nilsson, Matthew Groom, Jason Nassi, Adam Bogart, Xavier Files, Matthew Taylor, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Baraldi, Nick Hall, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Anderson, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Benjamin Shipper, Call McMahon, Chris Palmer, Scott McGovern, Nathan Fairburn, Kat McKenzie, Adam Highfield, Fiona Staples, Chris Halloran, Mark Abnett, Mike Murphy, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Demonakos, Norbert, Nicolo, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics and Art of San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to Upright T-Rex Music, wrote and performed Ah Panel's theme song just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode.